Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. My tone is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. We are witnessing the most aggressive military buildup in Russian history. We've been keeping tabs on the Russian president and his defense minister, Durov. Oh my God. It's a coup. We're dealing with a single rogue minister. What if we could free President Zakari? We rescue the Russian president. Hello? I'm trying to reach Matt Bourne here. This is the president of the United States. I need him urgently in the Situation Room. We are going to DEFCOM 4. Please, please respond. I need him to be the captain, the new captain of Hunter Killer, the submarine, uh, because he has to go and save a bunch of people, including uh, Gerard Butler, who is an actor who seems to have drowned. On the line, we have Caroline Goodall talking to us. From where are you talking to us from, Caroline? From sunny Southern California. Oh. <laughs> Los Angeles. The Laurel Canyon. Laurel Canyon, home of all the musicians. Fair enough. Outside my window, I can see a load of people setting off fireworks in a car park. Oh, my God. But hang on. It's not quite Guy Fawkes Night. That's in two days, right? Mm-hmm. But it's night time there with you. Well, I only left yesterday. I arrived, yeah, I arrived here last night because I've been in England because I've been um, very busy. But I got here today because it's the American film market. Uh, so that's kicking off now. And uh, it was time I came and checked on my house that has, uh, you know, some, some guests and, uh, you know, get, see some sun. It just started getting really far too cold in London. <laughs> All I'm going to say, Caroline, is at least you're not here for March. What do you mean March? What March? Next year. Why won't I be there for March next year? When the whole British economy collapses in on itself. Oh, I know. It's just dreadful. It's just <laughs> dreadful. I don't understand it. I've even been... I've been in the House of Parliament, actually, lobbying. It's... You know, it's very strange to me because I'm a bit of a global citizen and um, I do see myself as a European. My husband is Italian. He's a, a cinematographer. My kids were born in America, so they're American as well. I am also have an Australian mother who also is half French. I was raised partly in France. Um, I live also in Italy and I feel completely and utterly European, um, even though I was born and raised in, in the UK. And it's just going to be very hard for our own business that no one seems to understand because everyone thinks that we make British product but very little of the product that we make is actually British and we need to be able to sell into Europe so that we are not part of a quota system from outside the EU and now we will be part of that outside the EU quota system which includes of course the United States and uh, most people will go for a US product rather than a British product any day of the week uh, because it brings them in more money. So we're going to have a real issue, I think, with our industry and everything's going to go to the Republic of Ireland because they're still part of Europe and they speak English. So all those big American productions, including The Crown, might I add, uh, which is not British, um, will end up shooting somewhere else where they still speak English. They can still get sort of English-speaking crews, but preferably ones with an EU passport. But other than that, you're OK, Caroline. Other than that, I'm absolutely fine. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that was my little political soapbox, but you obviously agree with me. <laughs> I can't say for nay or yay whether I agree with you, because I'm vastly independent on these podcasts. Oh, right, OK. But you just said it's going to be dire. You told me March is going to be awful. That's true. I've met people who said they voted leave because they wanted to buy something, and they thought that maybe the house prices would go down. So they voted leave in order to torpedo the economy. That's ridiculous. Mm. Well, in a political sense, I suppose that's a nice little segue to your new film. <laughs> yes, sorry. It's it's your new film, Hunter Killer. Yeah. Um, starring the wonderful Joe Butler, Butler and uh, the wonderful Gary Oldman. 
unfortunately, you're playing the President of the United States. All I'm going to say is, <laughs> at least you're doing a better job. What was funny was actually I hopped on the plane yesterday and this woman was sitting uh, in the same row as me and she turned around and went, hello, Caroline. And I looked at her and I thought, you look really familiar, but it's hard on planes to place people. And she was one of the producers of Hunt to Killer. <laughs> I'm one of the producers of Hunt to Killer. And I went, oh, my God. Um, and she's absolutely lovely. And I had to admit, I said, I'm really sorry I haven't seen it yet, but I will, I will. I'm going to see it tomorrow night when I get to Los Angeles. Um, and she said, no, I, I loved you as POTUS. Because I actually wasn't sure if I was still in it. <laughs> You're never sure if you're still in things. And I thought since I was meant to be playing kind of fictionalised version of Hillary Clinton and she didn't become president, maybe they decided to reshoot and get an orange orangutan instead. <laughs> but it appears not, because obviously it was just cheaper to keep me in. You know, they offered it to me and, you know, it was kind of a real honour, I think. Uh, I was very flattered and then I did my best actually to try and get the vocal cadence of a kind of Hillary Clinton and I wore a wig that was um, vaguely sort of more or less you know kind of in her ballpark although I don't know if I did it quite I wasn't mad about it I have to say. But anyway uh, but she's actually got a very difficult voice because she's got a little Arkansas and she has some New York and, uh, you know, she's been from all over. And she also has a voice that's very different when she speaks publicly than when she speaks privately. And there were some tapes of her speaking privately, which was very different. Her voice is lower. She gets a little higher when she's speaking in public. And also a lot warmer. There's a kind of coolness about it when she's public speaking. And everyone's always said that she just isn't very comfortable uh, public speaking, and I think it's true. And I think this is one of the problems of politicians in general: is that we expect them not only to be squeaky clean in their private lives, but also to be able to be all things to all men, and to be able to turn on a sixpence and um, speak off the cuff. And that's very hard for most people. You know, they're not trained actors. And so what happens, of course, is that you get someone who's very comfortable in front of the camera and people think that that's who it really is and they basically are imposters, as in, you know, the orange guy. And um, then they vote for them because they're kind of comfortable in front of the camera and that's really frightening. But that's kind of where we are in the 21st century. Mm. No guesses who you voted for. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the film, basically, yeah, it's just basically Gerard Butler trying to get the Russian president back, which is quite topical, I would imagine. That was actually something that I wondered. Uh, and I actually asked, um, did this delay the film coming out? Because, of course, suddenly we don't like the Russians. Whereas when they were developing it and when we were shooting it, we were absolutely fine with the Russians and wanting to be more friendly. But that was before we knew that they'd sort of hacked everything and that they were also kind of, you know murdering people in Salisbury but apparently not uh, and it is fiction and I have to say I, I love the script I mean I really love these kinds of thrillers I'm completely enthralled and there's something about being under the sea as well in submarines that just sort of doubled down for me I remember seeing Tora 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 years and years ago when it came out uh, which was the big Japanese submarine uh, thriller movie uh, about the Second World War and then of course you know there was the Hunt for Red October there's just something horrendous about knowing that you might drown at any moment leagues under the sea and it just creates a natural drama as well and then you know conspiracy theories and politics it's really my kind of thing and to be asked to be in the situation room <laughs> <laughs> it's like I can go to DEFCON 4. Uh, it's just kind of cool um, to be in charge and have, have Gary Oldman being the sort of the hawk right-wing general and trying to kind of hold him back. It was just really fun. Well, Caroline, I'm going to shock you. What? Why? Mm. I know something you don't know. do da do da Yeah. You were going on about, obviously, us being on good terms with the Russians when uh, the film was in production. 
Yeah. But I'm so glad that I'm talking to the actual on-screen president of the United States regarding this, because I have had a few other people uh, I've talked to who are on the, the sub with Gerard Butler. But I found this news story this morning. So this is this morning, OK? Yeah. And I thought, no, I'll include it in, in the interview because I think it's worth it. You ready? Yeah. The Russian release of Hollywood action film Hunter Killer, in which US soldiers save a Russian president during a coup, has been postponed. <laughs> in Russia? Yeah. The distributor, Migogo Distribution, probably know better than I do, asked cinemas not to show the film hours before the premiere, saying it had not received a screening licence. Uh, basically, uh, in a Facebook post, there's always Facebook, uh, Russian opposition politician Dmitry Gudkov wrote that Moscow was not keen on the plot's hypothetical scenario, suggesting that President Vladimir Putin, who has obviously been in power for years, could be ousted. Well, that, that's really interesting because that kind of turns it on its head. Mm. Uh, because the idea was that there's a good president and then a bad guy coup taking over and that the Americans have to go and save the good president, i.e. Putin, um, against some bad guy who is plotting a coup. But as we know, Putin is a bad guy anyway. Mm. But, you know, these kind of films don't rely on Russian distribution. They're all pre-sold way ahead because you've got an action star. And Gerard Butler is a very big action star. And these films don't get made unless they're completely pre-sold and have actually made a profit before they're starting. You know, I mean, it's always icing on the cake if you're going to get some kind of a, uh, a release and you might get some money trickling down. But actually, the person who's is losing the money is a Russian distributor because he's already bought the film. It has nothing to do with the Americans. They're fine. So whatever he bought the film for, whether it was... You know, 100,000, 250,000, whatever it was, when uh, originally they pre sold it, um, he's having to eat that. But it sounds to me, if he doesn't get a license, that is very much because the Kremlin doesn't want him to. <laughs> I gotta see this film now. <laughs> uh. Yep. So, Caroline, what was it like working with the cast and crew on set? Oh, it was fantastic. I mean, Gary Oldman. Uh, I had not seen for many years, but we used to kind of run around in the same set together because I'm, you know, that old. And uh, I started out in the theatre in England and I was at the Royal Court Theatre where Gary was as well. And, um, you know, we kind of were all young actors together. We knew each other. We all socialised and uh, hung out. So it was really lovely to see him again. And uh, we reminisced actually we had a kind of very funny lunch where we all reminisced and uh you know we started talking about theater and he started talking about the first job he ever got which was he was the hind legs of a pantomime horse <laughs> and uh common is a really fascinating guy and just so charming and uh he was there and linda cardellini as well who I just love her work. Did you see that fantastic American series set in Florida mm. uh, that she was one of the stars of? I think it was called Bloodline. Mm, not off the top of my head. Oh, you should see it. She's just wonderful. So, you know, you've just got a bunch of really talented professionals all coming together for a scene that, um, you know, has got a lot of people in. Uh, and you just got to whack through it. We had a very interesting South African director in Donovan Marsh um, and, uh, you know, great crew. And, you know, it was just kind of fun. So, in you know, in between doing the scene, we were cracking a lot of jokes um, and just having a good time. Well, cracking jokes is good, but are there any sort of funny anecdotes you can share about the production of the film? Go on, give us some story. <laughs> Well, I will tell you something. I was a little surprised that the Situation Room uh, was actually in the Sofitel Hotel, not far from Gatwick Airport. <laughs> and so you walked in and we're in this hotel and then we're kind of sent through to the end. And uh, it was basically a boardroom that they'd, uh, you know, production designed to look like the Situation Room in the United States, uh, in the, you know, the White House. And uh, there we were. So, so we'd, pop out in all our 
costumes every so often to go to the bathroom and there would just be a whole load of people who you know booked in because they were, you know staying in between flights and so we were marching around in you know uniforms and um the whole nine yards uh and i think they probably thought we were a little strange uh but we all just blended in and no one paid any attention to us uh so those are the kind of anecdotes yes and, and talking to gary about being the hind legs of a of a horse you know, just sort of doing our job, really. Sorry to be boring. Well, Caroline, let's talk a bit about you. What made you want to get into acting in the first place? Oh, wow. Well, that was so long ago. I, I was actually quite lucky. I was um, in a school play. I'd always wanted to be an actor. And uh, I don't know why. I, just, I, I stuttered when I was a child. I had a very bad stutter. And what helped me get over it, oddly enough, was acting. I suddenly felt felt very freed. Uh, by learning lines, I didn't stutter when it came out, and so that was very free. So then I was in a little TV series I was cast in, straight from a school play, believe it or not, in uh, my last year when I finished school, and then I went to University of Bristol and I did English and Drama, which is a wonderful course, and I was a member of the National Youth Theatre. We had a lot of theatre in those days. There was rep theatre all around, so you went off to rep, I was a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company, at the Royal Court, the National Theatre. I did theatre for about 10 years and probably thought that I would, you know, I think I wanted to be a British dame of the stage. But then um, I came to Hollywood basically because I sort of followed a boyfriend and I thought it would be quite nice to spend a uh, winter in some sun and it was uh, sort of early 90s and kind of miserable time in London at the time there was a recession and TV wasn't what it is now uh, it was going through you know one of its periodic doldrums and the work was just kind of dull I, I think I felt that I'd done a lot of what I wanted to do uh, you know I'd done a lot of Shakespeare i would you know been in these wonderful companies wanted to spread my wings a bit and I'm half Australian so I'd also been working in Australia and doing um, sort of big leads in in shows over there and movies so I just thought well I'll just go to Hollywood and I'll hang out with my boyfriend and sit on you know the beach and write and you know maybe if a job comes up that's nice and um, it just so happened that it did and I got my first film that was Hook with Steven Spielberg and uh, that's like a great big housekeeping seal of approval. And uh, I fell in love with film as a result of that because when you are working with someone who is a genius and is so open and and just generous, um, you just fall in love with the possibilities of film. And I was lucky because many people have to scrabble around and you know, have hard knocks and then nice things happen. And I just found myself walking into a job uh, right at the top of the tree and not even realizing it as well. I was just so naive. Uh, oh, great, I got a job. Yeah, it's just Steven Spielberg and Ron Williams is in it and Dustin Hoffman and all these stars. And wow, <laughs> there I am. I'm driving myself to work down to uh, Washington Boulevard to Sony Studios every day. Mm. It was like a fairy tale. And uh, I would sit next to Stephen and uh, watch the monitor and he'd show me, you know, things. And uh, we used to say motion picture, motion picture, all about moving the camera. And I think that really inspired a lot in me. And uh, so as a result, I ended up having a bit of a movie career. But also it made me want to produce films and to write them. And so I have just managed actually... I've just wrapped my first major feature film and uh, I wrote it and it's called The Bay of Silence and it stars Clay Bang and Olga Kurilenko and Brian Cox and Alice Krieger and a wonderful French actor called Asad Boab, directed by Paul Lavander Oost, who is an Oscar winner, um, Oscar nominee uh, for Best Foreign Language Film um, and has won many awards. She's Dutch. And uh, I had my first taste of what it's like to actually produce, write, and finance film. And we're now heavily into the edit. So I guess, you know, all those years ago and, and being inspired is coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. Now, before the interview, <laughs> before the interview, I said to you that there were three films from your career 
that I was a fan of. Okay. Shall I guess them? Yes. Okay, you're a guy. I don't think it can be Princess Diaries. No. <laughs> uh, cliffhanger. Yes. Uh, Schindler's List. Yes. And the third, let me think. We're talking American movies, right? Yes, you may have mentioned it already. I've mentioned it? Yeah. You like Princess Diaries? No. Cliffhanger, Schindler's List. I didn't mention anything else. You said three. White Squall. No. Disclosure? No. Hook? Yes. Silly me. Silly me, of course I have mentioned it. Yeah, yeah, everyone grew up on Hook. How old are you? Right, I'm going to shock you. When Hook <laughs> came out, I was only three. <laughs> I know, of course. No, listen, I get people who are balding coming up to me saying, I loved you when I was a kid. And I look at them and go, oh my goodness, are you really younger than me? <laughs> Do you know what the best part is? I want to make I want to make this sort of a little bit of a good nudge here. People my age, people my age, because I've just only turned thirty. People my age have probably never heard of Remington Steel, nor did they know that Pierce Brosnan was Remington Steel before he was Bond. And uh, you were an episode of that as well, weren't you? I was. <laughs> That's so long ago. That was like what early eighties. <laughs> I did. They came over to London and they were doing something in England. I think I was a hooker on a train station who had um, important information. I think it's about the only time that ever anyone has ever cast me to play a hooker. <laughs> Do you know what? I saw something. I couldn't believe this. I couldn't believe this. <laughs> I, I saw this and I thought, you're going to have to help me here. I yeah. saw a film that came after Hook called The Silver yeah. Brumby with, with Russell Crowe. Now, the weird thing about that is, and you'll like this, I think, is the poster, mm. which has got you before Russell Crowe. Correct. <laughs> I know. Even then he wasn't very happy about that. I remember, uh, yeah, I had top billing because at the time he was pretty much unknown. He'd done a movie called Proof, and he'd done another film. Oh, yeah, done Rob Stomper. He was a superb actor, uh, but very young, you know. He was in his early 20s. But, uh, yeah, I mean, partly because of the fact that my character had more to do than his um and also to do with the kind of international how they sell it yeah i got i got top billing he's uh, hilarious russell's fab he's just he's never changed he just is who he is mm. now obviously hook i do have to mention the sad obviously passing of robin williams yeah fantastic actor that he was what was it like working on that film? I mean, you obviously you've mentioned working with Steven Spielberg. It was just a joy. I was so spoiled. You know, really, quite honestly, after that, sort of everything is going to have to be downhill. <laughs> it was a joy. It was six months. I remember we had T-shirts saying the first hundred days. Uh, you know, your average movie now might take 30 days, you know, maybe six or 70 if it's a big budget you know and this went on forever it was all in southern california it was the first year i lived here so everything was new uh you know i drove my little beetle bug down to the set every day obviously i wasn't called every day we just all had these wonderful passes i still have mine that was decorated by the props guy i you know just loved it i would hang out in the props department, I'd hang out in the costume department, I would hang out on set, I would show people around. The sets were so extraordinary that it became one of those go-to things to do for people who, you know, were in the know. Every so often, people would turn up and Stephen would say, do you want to show John Boyd around? Do you want to show so-and-so around? Do you want to show the Queen of Jordan around? And we just sort of take them on little tours and say, you know, this is Neverland and, you know, here's the pirate ship and, uh, you know, this is where all the Lost Boys hung out. We just took over the whole of Sony Studios and it was the first time it had just been bought by them because it was Columbia before that and it was their flagship film and they basically just sort of gave Stephen everything he needed and wanted. Uh, and Robin was just one of the most wonderful, inspiring people and so much fun to be around and obviously when he got into his zone where he'd entertain people it was just like a Robin Williams you know private concert you know 
um, often he would try out material. It was interesting. I mean, after a while, you realize that, you know, like many stand-up comedians, what he was often doing was he was just using the audience in order to see whether something worked, whether it, the laugh line worked or whatever. He never stopped kind of working on all of, you know, even his one-man shows and, and everything just on his own. But what, what he did teach me was the power of improv on screen, the freedom to just be yourself and to make things up. And you really had to be on your toes. That's one of the reasons why I got the job, I think, was because when, you know, I did have this audition with Robin and with Stephen, and it was just the three of us, and I just thought, well, you know, if I don't get the job, it doesn't matter. Look at that. I'm just in the room with these two extraordinary people. And Stephen had, like, a little Sony cam, and, you know, he was, he was videoing. And uh, really, it was all about improv, you know. Here's something, and this is what you have to do and say. And I remember I started improv I done a lot of stand-up comedy actually uh, I've been in um, uh, Edinburgh as a stand-up comedian I was one of the kind of little sidelines I've been doing early on and um, uh, it really served me in good stead and at one point I said to Robin you're not saying anything and he said oh no but I've got the job <laughs> and then they told me I had the job when I walked out which is one of the kindest things you know I think the great thing about people who are really truly talented and you know successful is they've got nothing to prove so they are wonderful to people around them and they're uh, <coughs> I get to sneeze and <coughs> what I generally find is that the people who aren't so nice are the people who aren't quite so talented there we go <laughs> oh dear so cliffhanger obviously I, I went with cliffhanger one of those pretty good Sylvester Stallone films. I think it still stands up now. The reason why I chose it, actually, you'll you'll like this. I think it was last Saturday. I think it was, Caroline. I went to uh, MCM Comic Con. Oh, how was it? It was was absolutely fine. I want to do one of those one day. I mean, I didn't go for the whole weekend. I only went for one day. And I met, you know, I met Colin Baker. I met, who did I meet? (laughs) Paul McGann. I met. The list goes on. Chris Barry, I met Chris Barry. But one of the people who I did meet, who I'd already interviewed before, was Craig Fairbass. <laughs> Craig, I knew you were going to say Craig. <laughs> Love him. And, uh, yeah, terrific guy, terrific actor. He's a bit of a kind of action star. He makes his own action movies, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he's cool. I actually saw Craig uh, in Cannes last year. Um, we bumped into each other. And it was just so lovely to see him because I hadn't seen him for ages. Every time I bump into anyone from Cliffhanger, and the same with Hook, we just reminisce because these are just such seminal experiences in anybody's life because, you know, they're just adventure stories in their own right. And Cliffhanger especially because also it was extreme. And, you know, there, there was the age of extreme filmmaking which was epitomized by carol co really which was this company that did all the schwarzeneggers and all the stallone films and you know there was no special effects in those days that were digital so you did everything for real now so much is done you know on the computer uh that people don't really have to get out of bed but we did and we were twelve thousand feet up every day in snow There's actually a great anecdote, which is really fun, which is there's this scene where the helicopter has to come down and my character is lying face down in the snow and pretending to be dead. And uh, the helicopter lands and I turn around and I end up killing the helicopter pilot. And that's how we get the helicopter. And then, of course, I'm killed later on by John Lithgow, who, of course, I did see recently because we were both in The Crown. And uh, anyway, so the thing is, is that the snow had to look pristine and there only could be one set of footprints. And so I very carefully put my feet into this one set of footprints to get over. And so did the first AD and everybody else. And they gave me a walkie-talkie and they gave me three flares that I personally had to light, which of course probably with health and safety wouldn't be allowed anymore. I had to light these flares when I heard on the walkie-talkie, you know, action. And at that point, 
you know, they'd set the helicopter off and the helicopter would come up and, you know, fly at that point, the camera needed it to, and then land and, you know, the whole thing. Um, so it basically all relied on the actor to get all this going, this massive stunt and scene. So there I am, lying face down, absolutely frozen. And we just had to do it the third time. And I had the walkie-talkie and I just shifted because I had to keep everything underneath me in order for it not to be seen from the shot above. And suddenly I feel this walkie-talkie just kind of edge out from under me and suddenly slide down and away. And I'm lying face down on a glacier. And one thing they said is you must never move. Uh, you know, the safety guys have got to come, you know, because they prepped everything because it's so dangerous. And so I thought, well, I can't go running after it. So I'm just hoping that from far away I'm going to see, I'm going to hear action However, the walkie-talkie just tumbles and goes over and down into a crevasse. So now I'm lying there with three flares and no way of talking to anybody. And I lie there and I lie there and I think, I think I've got hypothermia now. I'm going to die and nothing is happening. And then finally this little head pops up from about 100 yards away and goes, What the f*** is going on? I was like, help! I can't hear you. So that was all screwy. Yeah, it was like like that every day. There was always something you thought you were going to die on a daily basis. <laughs> but we had a blast. John Lithgow would go, N-A-R today, darling, N-A-R, meaning no acting required. So there was a lot of trudging across, you know, white landscapes and hitting people over the head with guns and saying one line, stop, go. Um, and uh, just kind of having fun. We'd get up there by snowcat and snowmobile and helicopters every day. As I said, it's extreme filmmaking. The, the other extreme film I did was White Squall, and that, again, was real. You know, we were in these storms. We were out on this boat. Um, and this is the thing that people don't realize with actors is that you do have to be very fit a lot of the time. And... Uh, you have to go through things that most people in any job wouldn't even imagine that they would be asked to do. And we, we do it. We're idiots. <laughs> so there you go. But it, yeah. it's fun. It's also got the most recognisable theme tune as well. Which has? Cliffhanger? Mm. Hum it to me. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah. That's really good. The other thing, of course, is that um, it was parodied for the opening of Ace Ventura Pet Detective. Did you not know that? I didn't. <laughs> no? <gasps> the opening of Ace Ventura Pet Detective is shot by shot, the opening of Cliffhanger, but it's not this woman who goes down, it's a raccoon he's trying to save. It is so funny. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I do know one thing. They made a Super Nintendo game of Cliffhanger. Did they? And they butchered the theme tune. I'll tell you now, Caroline. They butchered the theme tune. <laughs> This is the original. This is what the Super Nintendo version sounds like.
You're talking at least when the film came out, they made a game of it. Oh, I should get that for my son. He's kept all those old um, game things. And, of course, all this stuff now is coming back, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, record players and all these old gaming things. So it's great that, you know, I'm a hoarder and I, I keep everything because, you know, I've got boxes of this stuff from their childhood that I think we can sell now on eBay. Mm. And Caroline, obviously, I would not be a good person if I didn't talk about Schindler's List. Okay, okay. I will say one thing, Caroline, I will say one thing, not many people know this. I've only seen Schindler's List once, Mm. which is a disgrace probably, but I'd only seen it once a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. I hadn't actually seen it, you know, through my teens or through my 20s. It was about a couple of years ago I saw it. And I just cried at the end. You know, the the ending scene, everyone knows the ending scene. Yeah. Yeah. What was it like working on that? I mean, obviously, I'm guessing that with Hook, because it was Stephen, you were sort of cast as a result of that, probably? It was amazing. Stephen rang me up. I was in Vancouver shooting something, and I'm in a hotel, and I get, you know, on the lines like, could you hold Steven Spielberg, please? And I honestly thought it was a joke. You know, you don't kind of chat, generally, you know? It's not that kind of relationship. So obviously something was up for him to be ringing me personally. And so uh, he just came on. He said, uh, hi, I'm doing this film. I don't know if you've heard about it. And actually I had, because obviously it was in the trades, and I knew it was Schindler's Ark, which was the book by um, Thomas Keneally, which I hadn't read but had been obviously quite celebrated. Um, and he said, you know, how's your German accent? And I remember going, jawohl. <laughs> and uh, he said, look, I need you know an Emily Schindler and uh, he was very sweet he said look I can give you fourth billing it's not a very big role but I'd really love you to do it I was like are you kidding this is something that I would kill for number one to work with you again but also to do something that I knew was really going to have a very profound effect on cinema I just knew it just because of the subject matter and to be a part of that you know as actors we we strive and I'm you know, being serious here, we strive to do something meaningful. That's one of the reasons why we go into it. Especially as an English actor, you never think you're going to make any money. It's a vocation. If if you make a bit of money on the side, that's really nice. You can look after your family and things. But really what you're doing is you're trying to do something that you think that, you know, when you look back over a number of years, you think there's a few things there I did that were really worthwhile and I'm proud of. And so I knew that this would be one of them. Um, and so it was just you know, a gift to be there. And yes, I think we all knew that we were doing something extremely special as well. Stephen did too, and it was a relatively, for him, a low budget. Uh, he had fought for it to be in black and white uh, because that is very much what people's memories of the Second World War are, and he wanted that feel. The only colour is uh, was in the Pacific when you see, you know, Um, documentaries about that they're all in colour and it's rather kind of strange it's quite jarring and so I think he was very right to do it in black and white it's an extraordinary story written by Stephen Zalian the balance was completely right and I was invited last April to go to the 20th anniversary of Schindler's List and uh, it was at the Tribeca Festival and they showed it in the Beacon Theatre in New York and they invited all of us, and Stephen came too. And it was the first time he told me that he had actually sat and watched the film since he'd done the 10-year sort of edit of it, and he decided he was going to sit and see it. So we all sat and watched it, and for me, I think that was probably the fourth time I'd seen it. I had seen it four times, once in Washington at the big premiere, once again with my family around that time, so that was the early 90s. Once again, oddly enough, on television, the night I heard that Heath Ledger died. Um, and I was up all night because he was a big family friend. My husband had made three films with him. And I was just so in shock. And it just happened to be on. And it just seemed a very uh, poignant and the right time to see it again. And it was sort of on at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, and then I saw it again on the big screen the first time on the big big screen last april and then we all sat and did a q and a afterwards um and it just blew me away because every single scene is a masterpiece 
and that I didn't realize, you know, before when I seen it, you know, you're looking for other things. This time with, you know, 20 years, um, was it 25 years now, um, uh, you know, removed, you're just seeing it from the point of view of a filmmaker and what he's accomplished. And it really was utterly remarkable. And it is, as I say, it is a remarkable film from that point of view as well. And if you think that Janusz Kaminski was a first-time DOP, we had uh, we had a, a few Americans. We had our sound guy, Ron, was uh, Ron Judkins, uh, was an American. But mainly it was Europeans um, and, uh, of course, a uh, large contingent from, uh, from Israel as well um, and uh, Germany and the UK. Yeah, it was tough. It was... Um, Krakow in Poland just after, you know, the end of, uh, end of communism. So it was bleak. Krakow was really, really bleak at the time. Um, and uh, we were sh shooting in freezing cold. We started in late February, went right through. And uh, it was, uh, you know, really demanding stuff, incredibly demanding stuff. But Stephen, I think, was just at the peak of his powers. I just think he just knew, he just so knew what he was doing. He was so ready for it. Uh, but yeah, ironically, at the same time, he was editing Jurassic Park. So at the weekends, he would fly to Paris, and he was editing Jurassic Park. And actually, there's a nice little anecdote, which was the day before I was set to leave, I got a call from Amblin from the office, and they said, could you take something by hand for us? And I said, sure. Uh, so they said, we want it in your hand luggage, and, you know, if you could just uh, to production when you get there. And I was like, okay, fine. I'm actually very well known for leaving things behind on planes, you know, <laughs> whether it's handbags or coats or whatever. Um, and we did have to change planes, so there was this kind of moment when I had to come rushing back and check them. I had everything, including this little packet. I said, what is it? And they said, it's all the digital dinosaurs for Jurassic Park. We're talking mm. no dinosaurs, no Jurassic Park. Yeah, I guess they probably had a backup somewhere in Burbank, but I was carrying the masters. And this was the first time we realized the possibility of what digital effects was. Because prior to that, things weren't done digitally. It changed everything the possibilities, and of course, it was Stephen doing it. But the irony was that he was making Schindler's List, which is possibly the most character-driven, serious film that is, you know, and is in history books, and, and at the same time making another film that's in history books, which is Jurassic Park, editing that at the same time. The ability to be able to carry those two extraordinary films and curate them at the same time that's a measure of who he is. But the other thing is, as little did anyone know, and that's, you know, my fun fact of my contribution to digital effects and uh, Jurassic Park is that I was the one who brought the dinosaurs over. And if I'd lost them, God knows what would have happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will mention one thing to get us back onto Hunter Killer. There is actually an interesting link, I suppose, you mentioned that Heath Ledger was a family friend who was obviously working with Gary Oldman in The Dark Knight, which is one of my favourite films. It's, yeah, yeah, me too. And then, obviously, you've got that connection back to Hunter Killer in the present day. Listen, it's, it's two degrees. It's amazing. It is amazing. And I think, you know, in a way, that's the fun thing about our job, is that if you're in it for long enough, everybody comes around again for a second go. <laughs> Well, I'm going to give you a one-minute plug, Caroline. It's to basically plug Hunter Killer and anything else you've got coming up. Okay. Well, uh, please go and see Hunter Killer, everyone. I think it's a really, really fantastic action movie, and uh, I play the President of the United States. Um, I also have got a movie coming out called The Islander, which I think is really going to be great for gamers. It's a, a really cool uh, sort of post-apocalyptic water movie. Um, I uh, have got a film that I have just produced and wrote called The Day of Silence, which is a psychological thriller in the Hitchcock Polanski game uh, with the brilliant place bang of the square Olga Kurilenko, who of course is a Bond girl as well as a very brilliant actress in indie movies, um, and Brian Cox, if you've not seen him in succession, for goodness sake, you've been to watch that one. It's uh, all ongoing. Mm. Mm. 
Well, Caroline, it's been a pleasure interviewing you. Thank you, Matt. I'm sorry. I had too many jokes, but it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks very much for your time. Take care. Bye-bye now. Bye. Thank you.